Okay, so um, for the last part of the day, uh, we're going to learn um, about uh, um, sort of one part of this um, this workflow, which is visualizing and identifying interesting pathways and networks. So um, I think today we so far uh, talked about you know GSEA and G profiler. Those are uh, tools that allow you to input a gene list or a rank gene list and perform pathway enrichment analysis or enrichment analysis in general, gene set enrichment analysis. And the results of those are uh, these tables of pathways with p-values that you've seen. So what we're going to work on this afternoon is how to visualize those in a better way. Um, and you'll see what I mean when we get there, but um, actually the first part of what I'm going to talk about is an introduction to Cytoscape. Uh, the reason I'm talking about Cytoscape first is that the visualization method that we're talking about, which is called enrichment map, that we'll talk about later, uses Cytoscape and the idea of networks. And so this lecture, this next little bit of a lecture, is um, a little bit of a sidetrack into Cytoscape. And it will become more um, useful tomorrow when people are talking about different types of network analysis, uh, that many of which use Cytoscape. Um, but so what I'll do today is uh, give you a demo of Cytoscape, um, an introduction of Cytoscape, and network analysis algorithms in general a little bit, um, just to provide you some context, um, and then also answer questions about Cytoscape. But it's really just learning the basics of Cytoscape so that we can move on to the enrichment map. And then tomorrow you'll do Reactome uh, FI, which is a network analysis method that uses Cytoscape. And there'll be other things um, um, basically tomorrow morning that are mostly using Cytoscape. OK, so, um, um, so to kind of also reduce the amount of time that we spend having to talk about this, these basics of Cytoscape, um, we already uh, gave out some pre-reading material, uh, like this uh, primer or primer that we wrote a little while ago, how to visually interpret biological data using networks. Um, so hopefully you read that, it's pretty short. Um, as a result, I don't have to go through all the details of that. And um, we also um, asked people to try out Cytoscape at home, and that also helps reduce the amount of time we're spent doing basic stuff here. Um, and so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of some concepts in, in networks um, and that we can we can discuss um, uh, and then we can move on from there. So networks, um, you know, I told you about this morning, the difference between pathways and networks, uh, you know, the EGF receptor pathway could be represented as a network of connections between the, the proteins. Um, generally, the idea of networks is that they represent some kind of relationship between aspects of your data. So they could represent physical interactions or regulatory interactions or genetic interactions like, like uh, synthetic lethals or functional interactions that relate genes based on their functional relatedness. Like if two genes are co-expressed, they might be part of the same processes. Or if they have similar sequence, they might, be, they might have similar function. Um, so in, in general, there, it, networks are useful for discovering relationships in, in large data sets. Um, and it's better than looking at tables in Excel to figure out how things are related. Um, it's also useful to visualize multiple different types of data together, which you might use to see interesting patterns. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of network analysis methods and network visualization methods that are very valuable in biology. Um, and that's really part of the one of the reasons why people talk about networks a lot and use networks a lot is because of all these network analysis methods. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, the idea of networks has been studied for a long time in computer science. And uh, the um, there's a field of computer science called graph theory. And computer scientists call networks graphs. Um, we don't use that term in biology because most people, when you ask what's a graph, they think of a plot. So if I tell you graph theory, you probably think the theory of scatter plots or something like that. So, um, but just so you know, that um, field in computer science of graph theory has been working for, you know, more than a hundred years on math around, you know, networks and, and how they how they work. And people have de developed all sorts of algorithms 
that are um, available to analyze these these networks. And um, so, um, just as an example, uh, and so one of the powerful things that has happened maybe 10, 15 years ago in biology is that when we start getting more network type of data like protein interactions, um, people realized that you could take a lot of the methods that had been developed in computer science for a long time and math for a long time and apply them to biological questions. So there might not be, not everything in that field is applicable, but there are um, very useful things from that field that you can just bring over and start using. And there, some of them are very powerful. So just as an, as an example, a uh, very simple example, how many people have heard of this concept of six degrees of separation? So, so this is this idea that, um, for people that haven't heard of it, this is the idea that everybody in the world is connected to everyone else by at most six hops. And it's probably a lot less now with Facebook um, and email. But uh, this idea came from an experiment in the 60s by someone named Stanley Milgram, who was interested in studying um, like psychology and other, other fields. And he did this experiment where um, he sent he wanted people to take a postcard and send it to somebody in New York from somebody in Boston would send a postcard to someone in New York, but they didn't have the person's address. So they had to go through their friend network. And each time they sent it to someone, that person was supposed to be closer to this person in New York. And then eventually someone would know the person in New York personally and would actually be able to send a postcard. And each time they sent the postcard, they were sent, they were supposed to send a postcard back to the experimenter back to Stanley Milgram, and so he could track where the postcards were going. And he found that, on average, it only took six hops before it got to the person, even though the person in Boston never knew the person in New York or their address. So um, the so that's where this idea came from. And um, uh, the question that that raises is, how are people connected? How are you connected? How can, are, you know, what's the shortest path that I can go through a, a network of people to get from one person to another. Um, and in computer science, there's an algorithm for computing that. So if you had all the Facebook links, you could just find out how people are connected. And so the computer science algorithm is called shortest path by breadth first search. And um, it just goes through the, the network and it, um, it, it finds all paths. Um, and what's interesting about it is it's mathematically proven to find a connection between nodes if it exists. And if it exists, it will be the shortest path. It might be more than there might be more than one equally short path, so it'll find all of them. And if it doesn't, if there's no connection between the the node between the people, it will say there's no connection, and it will, it's guaranteed mathematically to be correct, and it's guaranteed to be as fast as it can be. So it's nice that these people in computer science came up with this thing, and then you, this this method, and then you can just use it to answer this question. So you might be able to use it in biology to find out if two proteins are connected in the cell somehow through a series of protein interactions, and if so, how. Um, the question then would be, is that path biologically relevant? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you need to consider additional information. But that's just the key concept of taking some algorithm from computer science in this graph theory area and applying it to networks in biology. So um, people have used networks uh, for gene function prediction, for identifying protein complexes and other modular structures in large networks. So here's sort of a, an example where you have this really big network and then one of the little regions here is a protein complex that you can predict. People have studied network evolution. So if you have protein interaction networks uh, that are um, uh, represented from different species, you can compare them and you can see how the, the, this, the pathways evolved. Um, people have, have tried, used this to predict new protein interactions or new types of interactions. Um, and then more recently, a lot of people have been using this to um, uh, for disease applications. Um, so identification of subnetworks that are sets of genes that are related to disease that are also potentially predictive of the outcome of the disease. If you have uh, these genes expressed at this level, they're all connected, they would, um, that little network and associated expression data would predict outcome of, of particular diseases. Um, and um, um, people have also been doing this with uh, uh, GWAS studies, for instance, instead of looking at individual genes. So I'm not going to go into too many details of this because we'll talk mostly about this tomorrow. Um, 
But uh, just as a very quick introduction to some of the many things that people have used this network analysis for. Um, okay, so what's, what's missing? So the networks that we talk about don't have information about dynamics represented, so everything's a static network. Um, and um, there are ways of representing doing mathematical simulations. We don't cover them in this, in this course, but there's software like Virtual Cell that helps you do that. Um, we don't have detail about atomic structures or uh, the cell type or developmental stage is often not represented in these networks, but it's, um, uh, they, they have been very useful for um, a number of different types of applications. So um, the, uh, um, and, and most of these um, points are really kind of taken uh, from this primer that, that we um, uh, assigned for pre-reading, um, and so that's, well, um, I can just review them even though I didn't talk about them specifically. Um, but uh, um, one of the, the issues with networks is that you might have different types of networks. So the nodes don't always have to represent proteins or genes. They could represent anything. Um, and uh, we'll see an example of that later towards the end of this lab. Um, and then um, uh, there are many methods available for gene list and network for, for network analysis. And so we'll talk about some recommended ones tomorrow. Um, and so that's just a, a, a very, very quick summary and introduction. Um, okay, so um, Cytoscape, as everyone, I think, uh, uh, did, did anyone not get a chance to install Cytoscape on their computer? Everyone's got it. And everyone, anyone have trouble running through the tutorial? Okay, if there are any issues that come up in the lab, then we can uh, work through those with you. Um, so I'm now going to switch to a uh, introduction and demo of Cytoscape. Um, again, usually you've seen this a little bit, but often this helps just broaden the uh, understanding of what this tool can do. Um, so Cytoscape is free software for network visualization and analysis. Um, it has um, many different, um, it, it does some things by, by default, and then you can add apps that add additional functionality. Um, it's developed originally at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, and then the people that were there, Trey Eideker and Benesh Rukowski, um, went on to other places, and they've kind of taken Cytoscape with them. I'm involved in Cytoscape development. I started after uh, when I met them originally, I think 2002, and, um, uh, and then since then a number of other groups have kind of joined. So it's an open source, free software development project. Um, the um, basic idea of Cytoscape is it allows you to visualize networks and manipulate them. You can filter and query them. There's automatic layout, and there's ways of getting data into Cytoscape. Your gene list um, can be converted to a network and then visualized in, in Cytoscape. And again, we'll see that specific things tomorrow. Um, Cytoscape has an app store, uh, so there are hundreds of apps, I guess there are over 200 apps now, that provide different functionality um, that you could, you could look at. Um, there are other tools out there for network analysis, but Cytoscape is the most popular one. Um, it has the most active community, so um, there are thousands and thousands of people using it. Um, and there's over 8,000 downloads per month. And so it is actually the standard network analysis tool in biology and other fields use it as well. Um, so the good thing about that is that there, people are investing effort into developing more functionality into it. And so, and there's also a lot of help, documentation, data sets, mailing lists, uh, tutorials, an annual conference, etc., cetera, um, and these apps that, that people are developing. Um, you can build your own apps. Um, you have to know the Java programming language right now. In the future, you probably you'll be able to write apps in R or other languages. Um, so this requires knowing programming or knowing someone who knows how to program. So if you want to develop your own added functionality, you can. Um, and um, um, the mailing lists uh, are very uh, useful if you ever start using this software and you have questions about it, you can email the mailing lists and the um, and you, you're pretty much guaranteed to get an answer within a week. 
So every Thursday we have a conference call and we make sure all the questions are answered, but they're usually answered faster than that. Um, so there is, um, there are people waiting to answer questions on it. Um, this is just a fun picture from a conference that we had in Toronto a few years ago where people spelled out Cytoscape um, who were at this conference. Um, okay, so the take home message is that Cytoscape is a useful free software tool for network visualization and analysis. Um, the simple software that you download provides basic inf functionality for visualizing and manipulating networks and filtering them. Almost all the power comes from apps that you download and, and, and install. So, um, okay, so I'm going to give a demo of Cytoscape. The rest of the slides are um, uh, in a few different categories. The next bunch is just a bunch of slides that are um, provide screenshots so that you can remember what I showed because when I move into the demo you I won't be in PowerPoint anymore and um, uh, and then there's some I'll talk about other slides after afterwards okay so let's hope this Camtasia is still working okay so um, so Cytoscape when you start it up um, you get this welcome screen, and you can load in data from a couple different different places. Um, uh, so, one thing that I'm going to do is um, open a um, a network file here, and um, I'm going to go to my Cytoscape directory where I installed it, and um, I'm going to load up some sample data, and um, I always forget which one I like to use. Um, let's try this one. I'm just going to click OK. OK, so um, this is um, a sort of sample network that I've loaded in here. Um, it already has a bunch of visual styles associated with it. Um, and let me just kind of change it a little bit here. Um, OK, so I've loaded in some data. I didn't really tell you how the data was loaded in, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. I just wanted to show you. Um, so I'm zooming in. I can move nodes around. I can select a bunch of different nodes. and um, these, you know, the circles are called nodes, they don't have to be circles, and the lines are called edges in typical graph theory language. Um, I can select some edges here and I can go to the view menu and, um, uh, or layout menu, and I can click rotate and I can rotate these around or scale them. So if they're really bunched up, sometimes I can just use the scale feature to expand them. So that's just a, a quick um, demo of some layout functionality. Um, usually what happens when you load up data in Cytoscape, you'll see a, um, uh, a layout that might look like this. Um, this is not very useful. It's just sort of the default grid layout, so all the nodes are just arranged in a grid. Um, so the first thing that you usually want to do is go to the layout menu and apply some layouts. So um, one thing that you can, I've, sorry, I'm just, my, the, the Mac operating system now has this full screen mode that I really don't like because one of the things it's done is it's gotten rid of the toolbar that is pretty important and um, it just disappeared. So somehow I need to figure out how to get this working without losing it. Okay, that's right. Okay, so, um, so you can click buttons here to load and save and, and uh, pull in information from different places. You can zoom with these guys. If I just select a little region here, I can zoom in just to that region. Um, these are all yeast gene symbols um, in the sample data. And then this button here um, lays out the network with a, a default layout, so algorithm. So this, the, these layout algorithms, as we explained in the, the primer, um, they work to reduce the overlap of, of uh, nodes and reduce the crossings of edges. So it just kind of pulls the network apart a little bit more so that you can see it. Um, and there are a whole bunch of different ones. So 
during the lab at some point you can try different ones. One that I like is called Y Files Organic, and um, that actually looks pretty pretty similar to the, the one that um, I just used. But you can also have other types of uh, layout algorithms, like this is a circular layout. Um, oh, that didn't, didn't work. I don't know why. Let's try this one. Okay, so this is a, this tries to lay it out as a hierarchy. It doesn't really work well for this network because it's not really a graph or a hierarchy, but it's not like a tree. But if you had a gene ontology loaded in here, you could load it in. You could, or a phylogenetic tree, for instance, you could. That might be useful. Um, okay, so let's just go back to this. That's just. Um, a demo of some layouts. So normally what you would do is load in data. I haven't really told you too much about how to load in data, so I'll do that in a bit, but um, I just wanted to go through all these um, uh, features fairly quickly. Um, so um, you can select networks here and um, you can put those networks in a new, a new network. So I'm going to make a new network from selected nodes, all edges, and that gives me a, a new network. So that's useful for kind of zooming in on a region of interest. So one thing that I might do is um, I have some data here that is, um, uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to zoom in here and click on some of these nodes um, and to show you this, the data that's automatically loaded up in this network. So um, when I click on a node, um, I can see at the bottom here in the node table the node that I've clicked and whatever additional data is loaded up. So the data that's loaded up in the sample file is gene expression data, and it also happens to be um, visualized as colors on the node. So red is, um, uh, um, I think, uh, overexpressed, and green is underexpressed. Um, and uh, I can let's, let me select a few nodes here, and so you can see at the bottom here there are um, a few different types of expression data that's loaded up here, and these are log full changes um, in the expression data columns. Um, okay, so one of the things that I could do is uh, go to the select option here, and I can create a filter that um, um, it's the default filter. So I just click this plus button, and I'm going to um, select gene expression that is um, all the negative full changes. So now all of the negative full change nodes are selected. I can change this so it's really only selecting the really stringent negative full change ones. And then I can, if I want, um, zoom out and see where those are. So the I've selected a bunch of nodes in different places here. If I wanted to move those to a new network, I could um, move them to a new, ne new network. They're not very connected. I can just see how connected they are. So in general, they're not connected. So none of the, none of the genes that were low in full change are, are, are connected. So I'm going to just close that and try another one. Um, so let's look at the positive ones. Um, so none of these are connected either. So, um, oh, it's because I think I did the wrong thing there. New network uh, from selected nodes, all edges. Um, yeah, so some of these are connected. So, you know, I could, you can slice and dice a network however you want, and um, just so you you know about that. This demo is not really explaining how to use Cytoscape to answer specific questions. Um, it's really just to give you a quick overview, some of which you've already seen, but others you haven't. Um, so um, the filters can be made arbitrarily complex, uh, arbitrarily complex, and you can chain them together. Um, and uh, um, whatever data you have associated with the network, you can um, you can uh, load up and filter on. Um, let's see. The other important thing that's sort of the most um, useful thing in Cytoscape probably is visualizing data uh, on the 
network itself. So I, I already have data visualized here um, that is um, showing different nodes as having different colors and the different edges are having different colors. So I'll tell you how that works. So let me just um, reset things. So let's try minimal. Let's not. Um, yeah, there's something going wrong with this that is slightly out of sync, but um, I want to. Okay, sorry, I just need to fix something here and see if this. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to try opening up a new session. Um, okay, sorry. I, I opened up a, another session file, which um, is, uh, I think, will allow me to do what I want, um, which is change the colors here and just show you how that works. So, um, uh, so I showed you that I have gene expression data associated with these um, nodes, and um, you can see that here. Actually, this has a lot of additional data associated with it. Um, this session file shows an interesting visualization, which is charts. So you can put it, uh, um, you can put uh, um, charts, attach charts to your nodes. So if you have data, you can kind of show it over time, um, and um, uh, there's a uh, a way of, of adding charts here, but let me just actually clear this. Yeah, so this is sort of a simple, simple style that we can get started with. Um, so you might, your network, when you load it in, might look something very simple like this. Um, so I'm going to change the fill color so that it um, colors uh, nodes based on how connected they are. And there just happens to be a column in here called degree, which is the number of edges that are connecting to a node. Um, and I'm going to select continuous mapping. Um, and I'm going to double click on that. And then I can change these colors here. So I'm going to select uh, this to be a light blue, maybe, and um, make this red. So now the more um, connected a node is, the, the, um, the more red it is. Um, OK, so um, some of these things don't have, I'm just going to select this, click this triangle as well, and make this light blue as well. Um, so now you can kind of uh, zoom out and see what the most highly connected nodes are. They're going to be red. So, um, and I forgot to show that this little this little window here allows you to move around in the network. So this, what I've just shown is how to use Cytoscape to take data that you have in your little spreadsheet associated with nodes and visualize it. In this case, I took the, this column here called um, degree, and um, I can click this little button here to float the window. You don't have to follow it along all, all this. Just It's just really quick to go over and show you some of the things that it can do. So I'm looking at this spreadsheet of all of the data that's associated with all the nodes in the network. And um, one of the columns that I just happen to have in this network is uh, degree. I can click on these things to sort them, just like you might be able to do in Excel. I just click on the, the headings, and they get sorted. If I click again, it sorts one way or the other way. And so I can see that the highest connected node is this, this node. And um, that should be basically colored as red as it can be colored. Um, oops, I need to do that. So I accidentally closed the, um, the, the 
table panel. So I'm going to go to view and show the table panel again. So there it comes back. And um, as I select nodes, oops, select nodes here, um, let's see. Um, the selection color is kind of red, so it's hard to see it with that guy. Let's see. Yeah, so as I select these nodes, I, I actually I picked red, which is the same as the current selection color. So um, let's try and select a blue node. Um, uh, I can select nodes from this table as well if I if I do this. Um, Okay, it's not being selected. The color is not changing as I expected, but it's okay. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so um, the idea of this um, style, as I was trying to explain, is that there's some data associated with the with this this information. So it could be gene expression data or whatever other data you have um, that you might have loaded in. And um, the, um, the, these visual styles allow you to map this data to some visual property. So I can um, color the nodes based on a gradient according to how connected they are. And let's try another one here. Um, I can um, change the border so that it's colored according to some other gene expression data. Um, I'm just going to cancel it because I can't see the borders here because I think the border is set to zero. So I'm just going to click this to set it to five. And now the border is um, thicker in general. Set it to 10. Okay, so these borders are getting thicker. Um, and I'm going to um, I'm just going to um, set different points here. That is kind of explained in the tutorial, but um, I'm setting this middle point to be uh, zero, um, and this point is the high end, so I'm just going to set this up to be red for overexpressed, blue for underexpressed um, in the border, and when I click OK, I should have borders that are um, potentially different than the um, centers. So here's a, here's a border that is uh, red, so this means that the gene expression is high in the particular gene expression experiment that I selected, and the border is, um, uh, sorry, so the border is red, and the center is blue, so that I, I had set the, the node fill to be, the, the node color to be based on this um, degree, so I'm actually just going to change it to use another gene expression uh, value. So the one I used for the border was GAL1R. G, and this one is GAL4RG, which is two different transcription factors, and I'm going to set that up to be similar to um, uh, the other one here, so um, let's make this dark blue. Okay, so now I've, I've selected the node center to be um, colored according to one expression experiment and the border to be colored by another expression experiment. And now I can look around in this network and I can see, I'm just going to zoom out a bit so you can see more. I, I'm going to look for differences in these different expression values. So here are um, uh, 
um, like here's a node that is slightly down in one experiment and slightly up in the other experiment. But these ones, these proteins are, or these genes are acting in the same way in both because they're both have a red center and a red border. So um, you can add additional information into uh, uh, the visualization in a similar way. So you could change the label color. I can change the shape. Um, there's lots of different shapes to work with. Um, I can make custom shapes. You can change the transparency and the size of the node. So that size is another another way of um, adding information. And so this is what I meant by the network view allows you to overlay lots of different types of information on the on the uh, on the to, to visualize a lot of different types of information together. So the type of information that's being shown here right now, there there are a few different types. So one is the um, these lines are, are representing protein interactions and also um, protein DNA interactions in this case. Um, I didn't show you that, but if you look at the edge table and you select some, some uh, time, okay. Um, if you uh, select the edge table and you um, uh, um, look at the different interaction types here, you can see that there's different types and you can change the colors of them in the style, I can just click here, edges, and change the line type for, um, let's see, interaction type. I'm going to make a discrete mapping. And PD, I'm going to say, is a dashed line. And P PP, which is protein interaction, will be this weird arrow. And so now you can see um, that some of these edges are, are um, I, I've changed them. So I've there's different types of interactions, there's two different types of gene expression data, um, two different experiments, and I can just go on and um, to my heart's content and change the visualization based on the data that I have. So this is very useful if you have a network and a lot of different types of genomics data, you can overlay it um, and then you can see uh, patterns that you might um, uh, not be able to say easily in a table, um, and you can use the selection criteria to um, uh, um, select different aspects of it and visualize it in, in, in different ways. So um, I think that's pretty much it for what I wanted to show. That's like the basics of Cytoscape. Um, there are some kind of fun things I think that you can do here. Maybe this one, I think. Um, I can generate a Okay, it's not working. Um, sorry. Okay, sorry, I can't get this to work. There are ways of generating these things automatically, but um, let's see. Okay, so I think that's that's pretty much it. That's the basics of Cytoscape, um, and that quick demo, as I said, just is meant to quickly show you some of the um, functionality of this. The next lecture is um, really about using Cytoscape and using some of these these things that I showed you and that you learned in the tutorials that you used before class. And so I think we'll just go back to um, um, that lecture, the lecture slides, unless there's any questions about, about this. If you wanted to uh, check out three studies that do about the same thing and see what's common between these, we sort of overlay the, the results from these three studies. Yes, so um, Cytoscape is really about, starts off with network information. Um, you can convert a gene list to a network, and we'll learn about that tomorrow with the gene mania, and those, yeah, basically most of tomorrow will be focused on that kind of um, conversion and then using the networks. But, um, uh, so if you have network information, like protein interaction information from different studies, you could load them both up, and you can um, take their intersection, for instance. So one of the tools here is this merge uh, network, so you can choose to take a union or intersection or difference of different networks, for instance. Um, and so that could tell you what's different between the studies. Um, there might also be ways of visualizing the data so that you, um, you uh, can create a network that 
shows how they're they're related, like if they're sets and how they overlap. Um, I don't know if that may, may may not be the most practical answer, but you'll see how that relates to the next. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you can create charts like um, I showed you when I loaded up the gal filtered um, um, uh, session file to start. There were these little charts, so you can show data over time or over multiple conditions as, as charts. Um, I think that's accessible in um, Now I'm gonna possibly get stuck here because I can't remember where the charts are. But anyway, I, I'm taking up too much time, I think, with that. So, um, any other questions? Okay. So. Um, okay. The next slides that are in this slide deck are um, mostly screenshots from Cytoscape just for reminder purposes. Um, there's an old workflow that um, is um, more focused on Cytoscape, which uh, shows you um, how to um, get information into Cytoscape in different ways. So you can have a, um, a gene list that's converted to a network with these tools like GeneMania. Um, you might have different types of networks that you're that you're loading in. Cytoscape is used for visualization, and then there's different apps for, um, for instance, there's an app in Cytoscape called Bingo that does the pathway enrichment analysis that we talked about today, um, and then we'll talk about these other ones tomorrow. Um, so um, the next few slides here are I'm not going to go through in detail, but they are. Um, showing a few different types of apps that are uh, have been useful for people and so you can kind of look through them and um, and see if any are useful for you as I said there are 200 apps so we can't go through all of them so this is just a way of identifying a few interesting ones potentially and and highlighting them in your uh, in your slides um, and then finally at the um, uh, so for instance there's a so text mining app that allows you to type in a set of genes and then it will search PubMed for um, abstracts that relate to those genes and will extract a network out of those PubMed abstracts and show you that network. And you can curate it, you can delete, you can fix errors that it might have introduced. Um, so that's called the Agilent Liter Literature Search um, app. Um, and there's, there's lots and lots of apps. The last few slides are sort of tips and tricks with Cytoscape. If you end up using it a lot, you might want to look at this to um, see some of the uh, um, tips that we recommend. Um, so for instance, if you use it a lot and you, it starts running out of memory, you can um, uh, um, increase the, the memory or these are kind of advanced, advanced options. Okay, so um, so this is the topic that we kind of really want to get to. Um, it uses Cytoscape, and um, uh, I'll tell you how it, how it works. So we learned this morning that um, enrichment analysis generally works like this. You have your experimental data, which can be gene expression values sorted, and you have uh, a pathway database like Gene Ontology, and you have your enrichment test that gives you um, a, finds out which pathways are enriched in your sample. Um, so you have spindle, apoptosis, you have some p-value or q-value, um, and this is generally excellent. Tens of thousands of papers have used this, I, this idea. Um, you get this table like this. One of the problems with it is that there's a lot of similarities between uh, the, the pathways that are um, resulting from, that result from these, these analyses. If you get a long list of pathways, there might be, um, you know, in this case, for instance, there's a lot of immune-related pathways, but unless I know a lot about immunity, I might not know that um, you know some of these are directly related to immune response because they don't say immune in them. Um, but you know, as a biologist, you can sort of see how they relate. But uh, the problem is is that these relationships are not obvious, 
um, in this table format. And so um, it would be useful if you could see these relationships um, more uh, uh, clearly. And so enrichment map is a uh, visualization method that uh, visualizes the results of enrichment analysis as a network. Um, remember I mentioned that networks are good for visualizing relationships. Um, so in this case, what we, we take the results of gProfiler or GSEA, and then you can make an enrichment map out of it. Um, and I'll show you how that works. So here's, for example, um, GSEA. So we have our genes that are up and our genes that are down. We run GSEA and we get um, pathways that are enriched in condition A versus B or enriched in condition B versus A. Um, and then um, we can convert that to an enrichment map where the pathways, these pathways like cell cycle, spindle, are represented as nodes. Um, and the um, edges connect pathways when they have overlap uh, in genes. So that might represent crosstalk um, between the pathways, or it might just represent that the pathways are one pathway is more general version of another. Um, but for instance, spindle and cell cycle have a lot of genes in common. Uh, and then the significance score here is used to color the nodes um, with the more deep red color being more significant. Um, and if you're using GSEA and you have uh, things that are enriched in genes that are going up and things that are enriched in genes that are going down, you get two different colors here. Red means genes, the pathways are enriched in genes going up, and blue means pathways are, that are enriched in genes going down. And um, it's not really shown here, but the size of the node is proportional to the number of genes in the, in the, in the pathway. So some pathways are very general and they'll they'll have many genes and so the node will be bigger. Um, this is the one of the overlap statistics that's used to compute how thick this edge is. So if there's more overlap between these sets, the edge will be thicker. And so you can see how um, Cytoscape, that visual styles, can be used to kind of make this kind of visualization. Um, I'll just go through fairly quickly um, different uses of this visualization, which is from um, the enrichment map paper. So this is using the same uh, MCF7 cells that um, experiment that Veronique told you about in the last lab. Um, the main, one of the three uses of enrichment map is sort of a single enrichment. So that's what you would normally do um, in um, if you just have uh, your experiment versus control, for instance. So just one two-way comparison. So in this case, as we talked about earlier, um, this cell line is treated with estrogen or untreated, so untreated is the control, and they did this at multiple time points. So just looking at this 24-hour time point, they had a few replicates. Um, we just used the gene ontology database, and um, so we, we ran GSEA, um, as you guys learned about, and then we are able to visualize the results. Instead of a table, we visualize it as this enrichment map. So you can see all of the things I mentioned, the size of the nodes is proportional to their uh, number of genes. Uh, there's green lines that are connecting nodes, which um, are pathway. Uh, the nodes are pathways. The green lines, you know, the thicker the line, the more genes the pathways have in common. And one of the things that we've done with this enrichment map is um, um, kind of drawn bubbles around. Uh, okay, so so the immediate thing that you see is um, when you do a layout in Cytoscape, is that pathways that have a lot of genes in common all get pulled together um, in dense little networks. And so you see all these networks here, and we've manually drawn bubbles around these and labeled them according to their, um, their theme. But if you zoom in on one of these, you can see the actual pathway names. These are all gene ontology names that um, are from the original GSEA results. So centrosome, microtubule cytoskeleton, spindle pole. So all these are really related. They're all related to microtubule cytoskeleton. And so instead of looking at a very big long list of results from GSEA, you now have this uh, much simpler visualization. And you know, right now, um, uh, these bubbles are manually created, although we have a method for doing this automatically that will come in a future version of inertia map this year. Um, I don't think that's, Veronique, that's not available yet, right? The automatic, automatic uh, annotation is not in the App Store, right? It's just in the development version, okay. So that, and there's a link to the development version in the, on the wiki, okay. So um, the, 
Um, the, so the nice thing about this is kind of gives you a visual overview of the um, of your enrichment results. Uh, and it should be faster to review and identify interesting themes. Um, okay, so here's another uh, use case, comparison of two enrichments. So, um, so in this case, we looked at 12 hours and we did a, a GSEA on the 12 hour time point and another GSEA on the 24 hour time point. So this is a little bit relevant to one of the questions that was asked, how do you compare different data sets? So if you have different data sets that you are uh, doing enrichment analysis on, like two different time points, um, each one versus control, then um, you can do enri pathway enrichments for both of them with GSEA or G-Profiler, and then you can visualize an enrichment map where um, the node border is uh, the colored according to the enrichment in one, uh, in this case, the 24-hour time point and the node center is colored according to the enrichment score in the early or 12 hour time point. So I can immediately see that if I'm interested to see pathways that are differentially regulated between these two time points, I can compare to control, I can see that a lot of pathways are actually the same. So for instance, RNA transport, they're both enriched in, you know, all the RNA transport pathways are enriched in genes that are going up in both, both time points. But here's a, a, a segment of the enrichment map that um, shows that ubiquitin-dependent protein degradation is not enriched in the early time point, and it's enriched in the late time point. Um, and here's also some other differences around here, uh, the reverse kind of uh, situation in DNA metabolism. So this, very quickly, I can see that most of the pathways are the same. There's just a couple of little areas that are changing between these two time points. Um, and you can go in an enrichment map and actually see a, a heat map. Um, visualization of the gene expression data, and you can click on these uh, nodes, and you can see um, that you know indeed uh, in this case this ubiquitin-dependent protein degradation or APC-dependent protein degradation uh, gene ontology term is very similar between experiment and control at the early time point, but it's very different at the late time point. Um, similar here. Um, it doesn't, the, the visualization doesn't really look like this, but you do see the heat map. It's not like a little arrow that pops out, um, but you, you can get the heat map. So this was made up for a figure to make it a little bit nicer. Um, the third thing that you can do that's quite useful is um, once you've uh, done an enrichment analysis, you can query it with an additional set of genes. So in this case, um, I'm looking at pathways that are differentially active um, in a mouse model where the one of uh, a microRNA um, was knocked out in heart. And um, as a result, cer certain pathways went up and certain pathways went down. Um, so you can then take the microRNA predicted targets and represent them as an additional node, in this case a little yellow triangle, and you can calculate the overlaps between all the genes that are targets of this microRNA and the genes that are in all these pathways. And what you see is that some of these pathways are very strongly enriched in targets of this microRNA and others are not. And it's kind of expected. There are no targets in the pathways that are going down because when you remove a repressive microRNA, you expect path, you know, a lot of pathways potentially to go up. Um, and uh, those are the pathways that ideally would be direct targets of the microRNA. But you see some pathways that are going up don't have a lot of microRNA targets in and others have many. So presumably these pathways that have a lot of microRNA targets are the more direct, um, uh, the microRNA is regulating more directly and these other ones might be more indirect. So you can do this type of analysis with disease genes or any other additional set of genes that you have that you're interested in um, to see how those genes relate to the pathways that you have changing going up and down. Um, and so that ends up being quite useful. So for instance, um, one example is a paper that we just referenced here where we looked at pathways that were going up and Ver Veronique did this analysis with Shahina um, in, uh, in my group. Um, we had pathways that were going up uh, and down in a particular cell line and um, we used a possum which is a tool uh, that's available online for predicting if um, uh, 
transcription factors are responsible for the gene expression pattern that you see, and um, it highlighted HIF1 alpha as like the, the transcription factor that most explains the, the data, sort of a simple way. Um, and then we took the targets of HIF1 alpha and we <coughs> layered it onto this enrichment map, and you can see that um, it sort of highlights a bunch of pathways that's potentially HIF1 alpha transcription factor is potentially controlling. Um, and so that starts providing a little bit more insight into regulators that are um, possible. Um, okay, here's the enrichment map that I showed you this morning that was from the autism spectrum disorder. And um, in this case, we used gene ontology and pathway database, uh, uh, KEG, NCI, and reactome pathway database, and also PFAM domains. Um, just for your information, there was you know 14,000 gene sets represented here, but when we filtered, um, we only got um, you know, 3,500 in the end that were re relevant to the data set and after filtering. Um, so Enrichment Map is a Cytoscape app. I think you guys have all installed it. Um, it allows you to create enrichment maps from GSEA data uh, or from GProfiler or other tools. Uh, there's a heat map functionality. If you have GSEA data, the lead leading edge is colored in yellow. Um, this part here um, helps you uh, choose a cutoff, so you can change this, this slider bar, and as you change it, the enrichment map will update, so you can change your Q-value cutoff. And so what I like to do is make the Q-value cutoff really stringent, and you'll see what pathways are, what functional themes, like what blobs in, the, in this network, um, are uh, very stringently there. Um, and as you make it less stringent, the Q-value threshold, you'll see other themes popping up. Um, and so those, you can get a sense you, by doing that of which themes are most stringent, which ones are least are less stringent. It's a little bit harder to do that in a table um, format. So this is just a valuable visualization tool to reiterate that point. Um, so the way I think about this is that the enrichment map and pathway enrichment analysis kind of gives you a 10,000 foot view of your data in terms of pathways. Um, and as I mentioned this morning, you want to um, use this to identify pathways that are interesting. So here's, in this example, we zoomed into apoptosis. And then one of these nodes and one of these circles in the remission map is a specific pathway in, in Reactome. And so what we then did is we went to the, to the Reactome pathway database, loaded up the actual, data, the actual pathway itself in Cytoscape, overlaid our in this case, protein expression data, and we could see that only one, you know, a couple of parts of this pathway were really different, differential, and we then further zoomed into one little neighborhood, which was a, uh, proteins that interact with caspase. Um, so that kind of shows you what you can do with this, these tools um, to zoom into something potentially interesting and also in the, keep your data in, in context. Um, there is a, um, a, a, an, another app called WordCloud, uh, that's available that allows you to select nodes in the enrichment map and get a summary of the words that are associated with that. So it kind of helps you in your uh, exploration of an enrichment map. Um, um, and then, um, but we actually have a lot of this automated now. This is a cookie that Ruth Isserlin, who made enrichment map, baked when she was presenting at lab meeting. So she just um, was so excited about the project. So it's just a fun slide that shows that enrichment maps are also. Um, not just useful, but also delicious tasting. 